Welcome back. I'm Cindy Jeffries from FMCS. I'll be the facilitator of the set for this afternoon's session. So I hope you all had a good lunch. We, um, I'm going to turn it, be turning it over to Tammy, the lead negotiator for the uh, Department of Education, to uh, give us some direction and a brief um, outline of where we're going this afternoon. Tammy? Thank you, Cindy. I'd like to take a few minutes to reset our focus for this afternoon. We heard a lot about what we said, what was said this morning, and it seems to us that you want to talk about this as an overall solution to student debt that combines all these items together. But these are distinct and separate standalone provisions that propose to provide relief to different groups of borrowers within each section. In some section, that means full cancellation. In others, it means addressing negative amortization. When we seek consensus on these sections, we're looking for whether or not the department should provide relief to the borrowers captured in that section in the manner that we are proposing. Expressing dissent from a given section is saying you do not want the department to pursue the relief we are proposing in that section. Expressing neutrality or approval of a section is not telling us that you do not want other forms of relief for other groups of borrowers not represented in that section. We will be having a hardship discussion tomorrow, and we will be hearing the ideas that you are presenting tomorrow. Forgive me, my screen is frozen. We wanted to put the hardship discussion at the end to ensure that we had time to hear your feedback on the regulatory text that we've provided you. We are committed to providing student loan borrowers with meaningful relief where we can. We have provided regulatory texts that would provide relief to many borrowers in many different categories. And we believe we are negotiating in good faith by incorporating many of your suggestions. Just because we are not accepting every edit does not mean we are not committed to providing much needed relief to our borrowers. And a few other things to remember. We are talking about the regulatory text. When we write the preamble, we are able to add additional clarity. So for example, on section 30.85, our first goal is to get borrowers access to the statutory loan forgiveness opportunities available to them. That's why we have already taken steps to encourage automation within those regulations. But we see this provision as providing an additional way to catch them if those efforts still fall through the cracks. And if we reach consensus on a given section, then we share a copy of that portion of the preamble with you, the committee, prior to that publication. At this point, Cindy, I'll turn it back over to you. You're on mute. Sorry. I didn't even look for my button. <laughs> uh, John, do you have a clarifying question? Well, uh, not so much a question as a comment, and you can tell me, can I do it now or should I wait? It's about a response to what Tammy just said. Okay. Um, and I, again, I, you know, now what all. Yeah. Yeah. So, no, uh, we don't want to, we're not trying to stifle anything. No, I just that's like, go, that's why, yeah, that's go right ahead. Go right ahead, John. Um, I just want to take issue with how the uh, Department of Education framed this. I love, I, you know, I understand why they want us to vote individually on each narrow provision without taking into account the big picture. But I think that that is not necessarily how those of us who are sitting here voting are either A, need to behave, B, should behave, or C, have to behave. I mean, I think it's one of these things where I think it is legitimate to say, I am, my comfort level with a particular provision turns on information that we don't have and other provisions that have not yet been fully fleshed out. So, I certainly understand the department's position that you need to, that we're supposed to look at these narrowly, but I think it's not that simple. And I do think it is appropriate um, for those of us who are advocating for our constituencies to take a different framing of that. Um, and I just wanted to sort of, again, 
uh, certainly the uh, Department of Education is entitled to have its view on how we should look at these, but I would like to set an alternative view that it is not as simple as we have to look at these in narrow isolation when it's in, in the real world, um, it's you can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. Our constituencies can't afford us to do that. Thank you, John. All right. Um, Jalil, you have your hand up. Yep, I have a clarifying question uh, mm -hmm. for Tammy. So I, if I understood correctly, I heard you encourage the negotiators to consider on the regulatory text, both for who is being offered relief and then the manner in which the department is going about offering that relief. Um, but then I thought I heard you say that if we vote down, where the vote down would mean that we don't believe a uh, particular group should get relief. And I'm wondering, I, I guess I'm wondering, is there a way for us, to, our vote down to say, not only to not exclusively say that we don't want that group to, to uh, be excluded from relief, um, and instead say, we may be completely okay with the groups that are being targeted under the regulatory text, but take issue by the manner in which they're being targeted or the manner in which that targeting is excluding other groups, um, other distressed borrowers who are in need of relief. So I just wanted to clarify what a, what a thumbs down means um, because I think there's some nuance there that I may have misheard or um, wasn't clear to me. We will be happy to respond to that in just a little bit. We will need to make sure that our framing further clarifies your question. So can we circle back to that in just a bit? Thank you. All right, Kira. I just uh, want to join on to what Jaleel said in that uh, thumbs down is commenting on the regulatory te text itself, not the motivation uh, or the group of borrowers. I think a legitimate reason to disagree with the text may be that the text just doesn't go far enough. Um, so we could agree with what is motivating the department uh, or agree with uh, providing relief to that population of borrowers, but want it to be significantly broader. Um, I think if it means something else, then we should we should have restructured how we were voting on this in the first place um, or per perhaps done uh, temperature checks earlier on. So we think of a down vote is because you don't like the text in that respective section, not that you want a different text in a different section. So that's our view of what a down vote is from you. These regulatory provisions are, are not meant to catch all. They are, you know, they are narrower in some regards, and we understand that you guys want a lot broader um, forgiveness provisions and waiver for certain things. But our intent was to keep these respective sections narrow and make sure that that impact for that particular group of individuals receives that benefit. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Kira. Um, okay, seeing no further hands, um, we do have an agenda uh, change for this afternoon. Um, we're going to be covering sections 30.86, 87, and 88 this afternoon. Um, in respect to um, sections 30.83, the department will be um, sending um, some text out this evening that FMCS will promptly um, distribute to you for review. So 30.83 will be moved to discussion for tomorrow, as well as the hardship discussion. Jessica? Yeah, I was wondering if Tammy or someone else at Ed could just give us anything about what's coming in 3083, because I think that, um, you know, I have some concerns about that provision and I have regulatory text drafted to send to you, but I wanted to hear you out. But if I'm not going to get a chance to hear you out today, then I don't really know. Like, I just feel like we're running out of time and I'm not sure that we can do that in the last, you know, tw tw what, you know, 20 hours. Um, but if you could maybe just even without reg text describe what's coming, that might help guide my limited hours tonight. 
I'm not I'm not sure they're going to have an immediate but, response to Oh, go ahead, Tammy. We are looking in, at clarifying how consolidation gets traded, Jessica. So I would recommend that despite us not going through 30.83 today, if you did have recommended text to please send it to us as we look at that later this afternoon and circulate that to you guys this evening, um, we'll be better positioned to take a look at it holistically. And uh, you may provide some additional clarification that we're seeking as well. So if you would be so kind as to get that to us anyway, separate from the discussion, we are happy to take a look at that. And then we will circle back sometime this evening with 30.83 um, for you guys to look at in preparation for our discussion tomorrow. Would that be okay, Jessica? Yeah, that's fine. I, as you know, I'm I'm all about clarifying the consolidation <laughs> thing. I think it's really important. Um, if I'm understanding you correctly and that the, 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 the point of the revisions is really just about consolidation, I do think that it might be productive to have a discussion today to allow some of us to raise some other issues to the department, even just at a conceptual level without regulatory text, but so that you wouldn't be getting those uh, proposals in a, in a vacuum um, if we have time. We will, if we have time, Jessica, entertain that idea. So thanks for that suggestion. I, I just don't know where we're going to be today. So um, stay tuned. If we can get to it, we certainly will do that today. Thanks so much. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing no further hands, um, let's move on to 30.86. I do want to remind you that, you know, I've been reading the text and I see the chats and, um, you know, I'm hearing the statements that things just don't go far enough or it's too broad, the more details that you can give the department on what it is that you feel is lacking, um, the better they can look at things and review. Okay, so um, forgive me if I press you this afternoon a little bit more for details on your comments, but uh, trying to get as much information to the department as we possibly can Okay, for their consideration before tomorrow. So with that, Tammy, I'm going to turn it over to you for 30.86. Thank you, Cindy. Let me make sure our screen shares have got the text up on the screen. This is an area where we have made a number of changes. In, 30 point, in section 30.86, where appropriate, we incorporated your suggestions. The big picture is that the proposed reg text does two things. One, capture situations where the secretary terminates federal aid access going forward for a program or institution that fails measures of student outcomes as required under the Higher Education Act or its implementing regulations. And two, Capture situation where the situations where the secretary terminates federal aid access going forward for schools or programs because they did not provide sufficient financial value to students. In section 3086, you will see we captured the broader set of circumstances that we think are appropriate here. There are situations where the secretary has taken formal action to cut off aid going forward. And in paragraph A, we lay out those kinds of circumstances. This is conceptually similar to what negotiators suggested in their language, but we did not take all the ideas in that text. The suggested language basically included any circumstances of loss of Title IV eligibility, but we do not think that is appropriate. For instance, an institution that loses Title IV eligibility solely due to institutional financial concerns would not be appropriate to capture here. I want to highlight two things here. One, by saying the secretary issued a final decision that terminated, denied participation, et cetera, captures the idea that these actions occurred after the exhaustion of any appeal options by the school. So if the secretary announces an action and the school challenges, this proposed paragraph would not apply until the appeal is exhausted. And if the appeal is ultimately determined in favor of the school, this text does not apply. And two, this language does not create liabilities to be assessed against the school as we noted last session. As such, institutions would not be subject to any attempt to repay these, uh, these funds under this provision. You will see in paragraph one, we capture failures of student outcomes 
measures. This includes things like cohort default rate and gainful employment measures. It does not include things like financial responsibility scores or 90-10. I note here that this requires the program or institution to fail enough times to lose access to aid as described in paragraph A. Paragraph two is other actions. Again, we see these as needing to relate back to the financial value of what students received. In advance of the meeting, we received a mandatory text changes for 30.86 from Jessica. We respectfully ask FMCS to turn this over to Jessica to briefly discuss her changes with the committee. Hi, um, so I submitted like in some ways what was a pretty technical amendment to 86 and it's the same for I think 87 and 88, so I'll just say it once, um, but basically, um, those of you who are familiar with PSLF may know that there was there's been like a historically like a lot of um, stakes as to if a borrower consolidates their loans. And for PSLF, some borrowers who you know potentially could have been eligible had they not consolidated consolidated and then lost some or part of their eligibility. Um, and basically, I wanted to submit a proposal that made sure that whether or not a borrower consolidated their loans basically like didn't matter for the purposes of these relief provision provisions so that, you know, just like in the most simple way, like for borrower has one loan where they would get the waiver and one loan where they wouldn't get the waiver. If they didn't consolidate, they get the waiver for the one and not the other. If they did consolidate, they would get the waiver for the portion attributable to the one and not the other. Basically, that is to say consolidate or don't cons consolidate, it shouldn't change your availability or entitlement to relief. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Anything further, Tammy or Jessica, before we um, turn to the committee for a temperature check and discussion on this? Yes, we wanted to mention that we agree with these edits. And um, I'd like the screen sharers to share the text that includes these edits in section 30.86 so that this is the complete regulatory text we would like FMCS to ask for a temperature check on. Okay. Did you want to walk through that or is there, um, can we take the screen share down? Okay. All right. Thank you. So is everyone clear on what the temperature check will be? It will be the regulatory text, including the amendments that the departments um, um, took from um, Jessica's submission. Okay. So if I could please see a show of thumbs. Um, Jessica, you had a question before we oh, go sorry. on? Are we at the point where we can do clarifying questions now? Sure, absolutely, Dirk. Go right ahead. Um, thank you. So Tammy, could you just talk through how this would apply to a school that loses accreditation and then the loss of force stemming from accredited? Sorry, so then loses Title IV stemming from their loss of accreditation. Would that be covered by this or not? Or would it I'm depend on ask, what the loss of accreditation was for? Yeah. I'm going to ask one of my colleagues to jump in. Ben, do you have a response to this question? If not, we can circle back, Jessica. The the sh the sheer loss of accreditation wouldn't just trigger that, right? So obviously there's a lot of accreditors that revoke accreditation for reasons just solely due to finances. I think that we would want to look at the reason behind the loss of accreditation and then build it into the department action. So, you know, if you think there's a way to capture that, we're happy to look at that. But basically what we didn't want to capture was, you know, we know there are some, you know, small colleges that are just in financially dire straits, they close, there's no record of sort of problems with what they provide to students. And so that is the concept we are trying to uh, narrow in and focus in on here. And also there needs to be a demonstration that students didn't receive sufficient financial value. Right, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, I'm like, this is like a way outside my expertise, I'm sorry, but like, you know, formally, my understanding is if the institution, let's just say institutional accreditation for now, if the institution loses the institutional accreditation, the loss of Title IV, the, the like 
formal basis for that action would be the loss of accreditation itself. And so I guess my question is, like, does this reg give the department the flexibility to, like, sort of look under the curtain of the loss of accreditation and say, okay, that loss of accreditation really was for one of the things here. So, like, we're going to sort of count the the sort of loss of Title IV due to loss of accreditation as being under this language, or would it like automatically be excluded from this if the technical reason for the loss of Title IV was the loss of accreditation? We're going to take that back. Um, we may have to to get back with you tomorrow, so don't please put that in the chat so that we can capture that and get back to you, Jessica. Thanks so much. Okay, um, Angelica, you have a question. Yes, my comment was to somewhat piggyback off of Jessica. Um, in some cases, are there a loss of accreditation where the institution goes on heightened cash monitoring? Also known as it also known as HCM one or two. And I would say that would be in correlation to um a, what a projected revision would stand in this particular case because there are, there are some accreditation factors where the department will automatically place the institutional heightened cash monitoring. Angelica, please forgive me. I was multitasking. I need you to repeat your question. I'm sorry. Are I got there... half of it and I didn't get the first half of it, so I'm sorry. No problem. Are there some accreditation issues where the department will automatically place the institution on heightened cash monitoring. So heightened cash monitoring alone is not enough to trigger this particular section. So I hope that answers your question. If it doesn't, stick it in the chat and we'll try to, to circle back and get you a better answer on that. Jessica? Thanks. I was wondering whether someone could talk through the reasons behind requiring the decision to be final is including the resolution of any appeals. In my view, I would I would understand the basis where there recoupment, but since there's no recoupment here that I can see, um, you know, it would seem to me that the, the secretary certainly doesn't take steps to um, to terminate Title IV lightly and I'm I'm not sure what the I think there's a lot of loss to students of waiting for the resolution of the appeal because it would delay it. Um but but maybe I'm missing something. Jessica, it doesn't appear as though they can answer that right off um hand here. If you could also put that in the chat. Sorry. I also want I also want to bring um to your attention just for Cindy. the department. Yeah. Ben is Ben is gonna take that one. Oh, okay, Ben. Thanks. If he didn't freeze up. Hey, wait. Sorry, I'm I'm back. Uh so the the idea here is we see situations where uh we cut off borrowing for student for students going forward at a given school or program because we have significant concerns about that school or program. And in the meantime, the very students whose outcome measures or experiences may have formed the basis or evidence for that termination uh, under current structure are basically kind of left to uh, possibly get a borrower defense claim, but beyond that are not really otherwise automatically picked up. And so we see this as coming behind after that borrowing has been terminated going forward to provide that relief. And so our concern is if it's not a sustained termination action, we are not in fact cutting off the borrowing going forward. And so we're, we don't think that that would be a place where we would pick this up. But that's kind of the concept is to say, if we cut off the loans going forward, we want to provide a way to help the borrowers that were basically captured during that period of work that justified that cutting off action. Right. Again, this is outside of my wheelhouse, but like my, someone may know more than me, but my understanding is that, you know, often those appeals drag on for a really long time and that the aid wouldn't often be dispersed in the interim. And so but maybe I'm wrong about that, but the, anyway, that, that, that like borrowers could be waiting years and years to sort of know whether or not they apply and sort of 
whether or not, you know, appeals can get denied for all sorts of reasons that like really have nothing to do with the merits here. And so I think, um, like, like I hear what you're saying. If the appeals process was in one day, I think I would like totally conceptually agree with you. But I think I would want to know, you know, have like a little more about how this like plays out in reality, because I just imagine borrowers might get it get stuck for years, and sort of whether or not the appeal turns out a certain way doesn't necessarily always implicate the like evidence and reasoned judgment that the department used in the first place to make a decision that I think is like you know a really significant and serious decision that the department takes seriously. So, I mean, the appeals vary in time and depending upon the reason for what you're talking about, I mean, there are some schools that will fight it and some that will not, um, as well as keep in mind that the appeals around, say, like CDR are more clearly prescribed and sort of more, uh, for lack of a word, like straightforward as compared to like sort of the essentially legal proceedings that entail a termination action. So I think that there is a variation there in terms of how long they take and what they look like there. But the other thing I would just note is you know, our, our goal with this one is not to have it be an application-based waiver, but rather to look at, you know, we know what where borrowers borrowed and we know at the time of the period they were borrowing. So we're not viewing this as a uh, apply type approach. Right. I I understand. I think I, I think we might have a slight point of disagreement, but I think I understand your position. And I guess I would just maybe say that in my view, that would maybe be better to the secretary's discretion in the future rather than to like put that limitation on the secretary's discretion in the rule. Um. Um, all right, thank you, Jessica. Um, Ashley, clarifying question? Yes, um, what about uh, those um, accreditations that have acted in bad faith in the past, like ACICS and those schools that kind of fall under um, their accreditation that have either closed or changed accreditation. Um, again, with the appeals process and the length of it, I know from experience from borrower defense, um, I know you said that there's not an application process, but um, we can see just from the backlog and the years and years and years that folks have been waiting for borrower defense. Um, are these loans, you know, if this is an automatic system, are they going to be put into forbearance? Well, um, the appeals process goes on. Are the borrowers going to be notified that this might affect their credit? Um, it just feels like there's a lot of missing language that kind of defines these other things. Um, we're happy to take language if you think there's things that are missing with regard to those pieces, and we're happy to take a look at them. Thank you. Jessica. Thanks. I know I'm technically not supposed no, to say this right now. But um, I, I just want to say thank you for including this. I know that we're really only supposed to ask clarifying questions, but this is a brand new provision. And I just wanted to say that um, I, I, I know I'm asking a bunch of questions, but I really appreciate you hearing from the committee that this was important and that you putting out language there. And I think it really has the potential to help a lot of people. And so uh, thanks. Thanks, Jessica. Kathleen? Uh, yes, I agree with a lot of the text that's here and just wanted to ask a clarifying question again around sufficient financial value in part two. So is there a regulatory definition of providing sufficient financial value? I notice this doesn't link over to gainful employment like some of the other text does. So I just wanted to, to know, does the department have a specific definition of that that they're referring to that schools could understand and follow here? Uh, sure. So on the, on the school side, you know, I think part of what we are saying here is that we view the process and proceedings with, with respect to the school as being separate from the process and proceedings here. That's partially why we've got that piece about the exhaustion of any appeals and the part about liability, because we see this as sort of running separate from that. But basically, the um, you know the the first paragraph, or I guess not the first one, but the paragraph that talks about student outcomes measures would pick up CDR or gainful employment, where again those have hit the point where uh, the secretary has taken the termination action. So it wouldn't just be like a single failure if the program stays in. Um, and then with regard to sort of the other category, we think that that is something that would come up in the actual termination action. So, you know, when we deny recertification or things of that nature, we explain to the school why we took that action. And so we would be looking at that type of question as we, in terms of what the underlying rationale for why we did the thing we did. But again, that's partially why we have this language about saying this follows after 
sort of the administrative proceedings with respect to the school are done and that there's not liability for the school. Okay, thank you. Jessica? Did yeah, you can I just clarify, because I think that this was um, part of the proposal that I put in. I think the idea is, in my mind, in like very simple terms, like what happens once a school can no longer give Title IV aid? What happens to the students who were at that school? I think that's the question. And I think um, uh, this sort of, there are lots of complicated questions about what happens before a school no longer has access to Title IV aid. And I think that this is is really not to, to answer those, but just to the what happens after. Thanks for that clarification, Jessica. All right, seeing no further hands, let's go ahead and take a temperature check on 30.86. Um, could I see your thumbs, please? Okay, I'm not seeing any thumbs down. Am I missing something? Okay. All right, so um, we can open this up for further discussion if you'd like um, at this point as we did this morning. Um, is there anything anyone would like to uh, let the department know, share with the department, ideas, suggestions, concerns on 30.86? All right, sounds good. Let's move to 30.87, uh, Tammy. Yes, if my screen shares would get the text up. This is waiver following a closure. In section 3087, we're capturing a similar idea, but it is a more limited situation. Here, we are trying to get at circumstances where a program or institution has failed an outcome measure in a way similar to how it's captured in the section 30.86, paragraph A1. The difference is that we have seen in the past that some institutions or programs will fail a measure once and then choose to close. In those situations, there will not be additional years of data to make a judgment about student outcomes. Therefore, since that program or institution has closed following that failure, we think, we think it is fair that the secretary to reasonably infer the program or institution did not provide sufficient financial value to students and therefore warrants providing relief to the borrower. Again, it is important to note that this only includes programs or institutions that close. And again, we incorporated reg text from Jessica, the same reg text that she spoke to before. So I just ask um, that the team share the appropriate reg text that references Jessica's edits. Um, and I'll turn it back to you, Cindy. All right, thank you. Is, uh, there we go. So this has the appropriate edits from the things that uh, the department did adopt from um, Jessica's um, proposal that she sent in. That would be inclusive in the temperature check when we do it for 30.87. Okay. Um, if, thank you. I see you read my mind. I don't even have to say. Thanks. All right. So I will open it up for clarifying questions prior to the temperature check. Jessica? Um, sorry, I don't mean to sound repetitive. I actually think this is a different question here. Could you explain what final determination means here? Because I don't actually think these are the kind of determinations that could be appealed, right? Um, we wanted to capture here where the, um, the outcomes measures are final. So a couple of them have the ability to be appealed, but um, it's a little different than, yes, you're correct about the, like, you know, we issue a perm review saying we intended to deny recertification and then it needs to go through, but we're just trying to indicate that the, um, you know, a good example would be like, say you, you fail the court default rate one year, uh, but not high enough to hit that 40% threshold. You decide to close. We want to use the sort of absence of future data to catch you there. But the idea would be that it would have to be our sort of final read of this is what your court default rate is. Okay, thank you, Ben. 
Any other clarifying questions before the temperature check? All right, seeing no hands, let's go ahead and take a temperature check on 30.87. Can I see your thumbs, please? Okay, I'm not seeing any thumbs down. All right, let's open it up for discussion, Jessica. Thanks, I just on that same issue, I think, you know, I think you understood, I would use those phrases. I did have questions, but I think, you know, through our back and forth, I think you understood on 86 that I would um, substantively, I do not think that there's a reason to necessarily wait for the resolution of any appeals and certainly not to, to take away the discretion of the secretary to decide in the future that the secretary doesn't need to wait for the resolution of appeals. So I think I would I would in 86 want to take that the term final out of the stat or out of the proposed reg for substantive reasons. Here I just I'm not sure that it I think it's just confusing as to what is a final determination. And so I think I would maybe suggest striking the word final just for clarity's sake. I think it would just be a determination by the secretary. And again the secretary would obviously maintain the discretion to make that determination at any point. It says that the secretary may waive the balance. So um I I think I think it could come out of both, but for different reasons. Thank you. Um Barman, did you capture that or did you want that dropped in the chat as a idea? Got it? Okay. All right, great. Um Scott Buchanan. Yeah, I just offer, I, I, I know this is sort of, we have some slightly changed language in front of us, um, but, uh, and I think we're going to have to look at that in terms of implementation um, and how that would actually work um, with a lot of these things. I do want to emphasize um, that sort of the complexity that's being overlaid here is something the department is going to have to strongly consider about how they fund and implement, um, because some of these new additions um, particularly um, will be very challenging operationally. Um, and uh, and and will require a lot of time, absent significant resources. Um, so anyway, we're gonna have to we'll take a look at that and provide any other feedback we can since we're seeing the language just right now. So I can't give any sort of detailed analysis about that, but that's something that needs to be considered. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate that, Jessica. Yeah, Scott, I'm not sure if that was directed at the at the consolidation language in particular or the, this provision in general, but I think as to the consolidation language, it's just. It's, it's just copied and pasted from what was already in, I think, proposed 3085B. And I think it wouldn't really involve the treatment of consolidation loans any differently than, for example, you do right now with closed school discharge or false certification discharge, where you just sort of look under, you know, under the hood of the consolidation loan to see the underlying loan and then apply it. I mean, I'm not a servicer. I'm sure it's complicated. It, um, you know, it's not like you just press a button on a computer, but I think it's not something that's categorically different than what the, the department already does in a lot of other respects. Thanks, Jessica. Tammy? Jessica, we would be interested if you so choose to go into a caucus to discuss uh, 30.86. We do have some time. So if that's something that you think would be beneficial, we'd be happy to go ahead and go into a caucus with you. Sure. Thank you. At some point, it doesn't even have to be right now, but that would be something that we'd be interested in doing if you would so like. Yeah, yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks. Okay, so um, you tell me when you want to do that caucus. We've, um, I don't see any more hands on 30.87. We could do it now before we move, or we could cover the next section. Um, Let's cover the next session, okay. section, Cindy, and then we can okay. go We'll couple All it right. with a break. Great. That's what I was going to say. We only got <laughs> Great one minds more. Great think alike, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> All right. right, so let's move on to section 30.88. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Tammy for the uh, walkthrough on that. All right, screen shares, get that screen up for us. 30.88. Great. 
This is an area where we indicated at the last session that we would be providing updated text. The goal of this section is to capture programs or institutions that have had poor debt to earnings rates or provide graduates with insufficient earnings as they close. The difference with this section is that these are going to be programs that did not have official rates and then closed. That would be captured under section 30.87. Rather, we know that many institutions over time have shifted their programmatic offerings as they have seen data come out, of, come out about their performance. So we wanna give relief to borrowers when we have data showing the financial returns to students were insufficient and then the program, um, program or school closed. I wanna reiterate that point. The program or school has to have closed. This is not about open schools. Because this is not a situation where there would be official rates indicating a program's results on these measures, we've crafted regulatory text that explains how we would measure debt to earnings rates and the earnings premium test. This text reflects the data we have available and also various limitations that were in place when these data were run. For instance, we are proposing to not include certain medical or dental programs in this calculation because those would have had their earnings evaluated after a longer time in repayment, and we do not have those data. We have adjusted the proposed language in paragraph A2 to better clarify this exception. I also want to draw your attention to paragraph C of this section, which introduces an additional concept. The goal of this paragraph is to provide relief to borrowers who attended closed colleges where the majority of federal aid volume was associated with programs that failed to meet the standards laid out here. We would apply this to borrowers who attended programs where we didn't have the data to evaluate whether their program passed or failed. The idea is that if the college overall had a majority of its aid in failing programs enclosed, that the secretary can reasonably infer the program did not provide sufficient financial value to students and borrowers should not have to bear the consequences of that fact that we do not have the data on their program. Again, Jessica provided the same text that she provided um, for all the other sections. And so we're not gonna ask her to go ahead and, and go over that again, but that speaks to uh, the additional red text that you see regarding the consolidation piece. Turn it over to you, Cindy. Okay, thank you, Tammy. Um, Kara. I just have one clarifying question, and I think these are all great additions. I'm really excited to see them. Uh, in C3, the department notes that uh, it will um, provide relief if the conditions described in paragraph, paragraph A3 are met, but the department doesn't have reliable data. What data would the department rely upon then? Because it, it might be better to clarify that language. So, yeah, so the, the issue here is, you know, the size of programs at colleges vary substantially. So there are many that are too small to have enough data to evaluate their debt to earnings rates or their earnings premium. And so what we're trying to say is, if you've got a school where the majority of the programs where we did have data failed, and the school closed that we would draw the inference that we're had we been able to get data on that program like had it been big enough it's likely that it would have failed and so that's what we're trying to pick up there is basically to start, sort of address what do we do in a situation where we know a majority of the students failed but we have these smaller programs where we don't have data so it's like how it's saying how we want to fill in the data gaps basically okay thank you ben um, just before I call on you, Jessica, I do want to announce that Sarah Betts is, is now at the table in place of Sherry Gamage for four-year student loan borrowers. So welcome, Sarah. Jessica? Yeah, I think um, I I had the same question, and I think maybe, Ben, based on your answer, the department might consider saying something like, does not have detailed data or sufficiently detailed data or the requisite data or some, I, I, it just, there's a, there's a negative inference that somehow the data is unreliable that I don't think was reflected in your answer. Um, and I have a similar, like very minor question here um, on A3, it says for the period in which the borrower received loans for enrollment in the program, the secretary has reliable data, blah, 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 blah. I think that that could be 
red is like requiring some like borrower by borrower analysis of like their whole attendance period. And I assume that's not what you meant. I assume you meant if, you know, if the borrower was attending during a period in which you have data. So if, if I'm correct, I think per, possibly it could just be fixed really easily by saying for any period in which the borrower received loans or something like that. But it, you're welcome to clarify if I misunderstand. I'm not, I'm not seeing where Tammy went. Oh, I'm here. Oh, there you are. You you moved over there. Okay. All right. Good. All right. If I'm lost. Yeah. Don't find me. No, I think, uh, you know, that there are some, I, well, I know that there are some people having difficulties today with internet service and it's been freezing up and then they blink off the screen for just a second. So I lost you there just for a minute, Tammy. Nice. All right. So, um, I don't know if the department had a response to that, if Jessica was understanding that correctly or not. Yeah, one of the things we'll do, Jessica, is we will we will look at this and what we do not adjust in the regs because we do not regulate the secretary's actions. We, we, we can address in the preamble to provide additional and further clarification. So um, go ahead and make sure that that is in the chat so that we can capture that concern, and then we can kind of address this a little bit more in detail um, in the preamble. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. Yes, ma'am. Any further questions um, before we take the temperature check? Do you want to say, I see Benjamin Lee, you came in um, in place of um, Scott Buchanan, correct? All right, great. Welcome. All right, let's go ahead and see the temperature, um, the thumbs for your temperature check on 30.88. Down <laughs> your wig when yours. Okay, all right, great. Thank you. I'm not seeing any thumbs down, so... Um, we can open it up for further discussion if anyone has anything they'd like to um, ask, uh, add at this point for 30.88. Okay. Um, so why don't we go ahead and um, set up the caucus that um, was asked for by the department with Jessica. Yes, Cindy, would you please mm -hmm. um, put in me, Ben, Soren, Brian Siegel, Genevieve, Toby, and Jessica in the caucus? And then we'll have a, a slight break after that caucus. Okay. Do you have uh, any idea on the length of the caucus so the um, rest of the people can? Plan accordingly. Let's, let's do the caucus for 10 minutes. Oh, okay. I think we can cover it then. All right. And I can always check in and, and let people know. So, um, all right. So I have Ben, Soren, Brian Siegel, Gen Z, and Toby, and Jessica, and yourself, right? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we can go ahead and um, go off the live stream, and we will get people moved to that um room.
Okay, we are back live and appreciate it. Um, everyone is back. There were a couple requests made of the department that uh, have been discussed. So I'm going to turn it over to Tammy to address um, a couple of those questions. Great. Thank you guys so much for hanging in there. Um, we have heard your request for complete reg text that includes the changes that we made um, prior since the time that we sent the, the uh, reg, a mandatory reg text to you and also the changes that we included as Jessica mentioned earlier today. So what we plan to do, we are still changing some things in 30.83. So what we will do later this evening is send to you a reg text version that in parts before subpart G, you already see that that's in red line. There have been no changes to that. But in 30.80 and beyond, what you will see is the reg text in clean reg text and any of the changes that we've made since the time we've posted the reg text live will be indicated in red lines. So what you'll see is actual red text that includes the information that Jessica provided to us and any additional changes that we had to make since we've posted the reg text. Okay, so please stay tuned. We'll try to get it to you as quick as we can after the negotiations are over, but we plan to give that to you um, sometime this evening. The other item that you, apparently there's just been um, popular demand on giving you some time to discuss 30.83. So we understand that you want to talk about this and, and how it would work for people who have loans just after the date specified. We are still working on other parts of this section, but we want to um, we want to give you some time to talk about it. So we're going to open it up for you to share your comments and your opinions about borrowers who have loans after these specified dates so that we may consider your discussion later today. So, Cindy, I'll turn it over to you and we can open it up for discussion. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, so, with that, um, let's open the floor for discussion um, on 30.83 as outlined. Jessica. Thanks. Um, I, first, I want to say, you know, I, I think that this is a really important avenue for debt relief for many people who really, really need it. I think it's... Um, these old loans really follow people for the rest of their lives. There's, you know, I have clients, you know, one who hopefully will comment today, you know, they, their loans are from one before I was born, right? The loans don't go away. They're just trying to help a client. The government has destroyed all of the relevant records and the bankruptcy he filed because the bankruptcy was so old um, because the loans are even older, right? So these, these, these old loans stay around forever. It's like tremendously important that it accrues so much interest and they really burden people for the rest of their lives. So I want to start by saying, I really appreciate the department's attitude towards tackling this issue. It's tremendously important. I really appreciate what you're trying to do here. I think that the thing that, um, that I, I would like to, and, sorry, and one more thing I want to appreciate the department for is that you have, um, between the second and third sessions, eliminated the idea that we need to count certain months um, I think the counting of months really like inures to the detriment of the borrower to the extent that there are records that are missing. And so I really appreciate that this proposal does not require, you know, it requires that you understand the, the start date and the, that's it. Um, and we don't need to know what happened every month since then, which really um, is important when records don't exist. I think that um, one concern that I have that I think is shared by some other people is that um, borrowers who are just so close to this will just lose their shot um, in that, you know, a borrower who's, you know, a, a graduate borrower, for example, who's 24 years and 10 months um, will just will just have that opportunity that will not have that opportunity. And I understand that there are, um, you know, sometimes line drawing exercises the government has to do, but this seems like an incredibly stringent one. And I, I hope that the, the department might consider some other alternatives. Okay, thank you, Jessica. Uh, Jalil. Um, I think, well, first, it's a clarifying question. Can the department explain why it has to have this cliff or why it's proposing the um, cliff around the 25 years and um, the borrowers will be cut off? Is there a reason why it has to happen in this moment, why it can't be rolling relief? Hey, 
Tammy? I actually had something to say about um, okay. Jessica's, Jessica, you had mentioned alternate text. Would you be so kind as to provide that alternate text to us or some proposed text on that? That'd be super helpful. Thanks yeah. so much. Yeah, sure. Um, Julia, we're going to get back to you. I'm, I'm waiting for an official response on that one. So we're going to go ahead and move on to the next person and then I'll circle back. Okay, well, that would, yeah. Well, thank you, I'll, sir. I'll re raise my hand. Okay, thank you. Kira? Like with Jaleel and Jessica, I'm also deeply concerned about the cliff here. I'm especially concerned about this cliff as it applies to folks who have had long periods of time where their loans have been in default. Um, that time will not be counted under the IDR account adjustment, but will be counted under the department's proposal. Um, and so, like others have suggested, um, I recommend removing the cliff uh, and can also provide uh, possible regulatory language as well. In addition, um, like Jessica already said, this, this proposal is so important. Um, it's also, I mean, I talk to clients all the time who feel like their student loans are a death sentence that will follow them until they hit the grave. Um, and it is just incredibly frustrating for them. It keeps them in a cycle of poverty. And this is even more true for, for borrowers who have had periods in default and again, have experienced the extreme power of the department's involuntary collection efforts. Um, I would also ask the department consider including a provision that's analogous to its save a uh, shorter repayment period for folks who have smaller loan balances. Um, so to discharge the debt after 10 years uh, for folks that borrowed $12,000 or less. Um, the department has already provided the justification for doing so in the save plan. And I think it makes sense to extend it more broadly here as well. Okay, thank you, um, Kira. If you could, um, I think I heard you say that you might be able to provide some um, proposed text on removing the cliff. And then you also suggested that the uh, for smaller loan balances, twelve thousand or less, that the be similar to the safe program. Um, I don't know if you want to put that concept in the. Um, okay, thanks, uh, Richard. Put that in there for you, so don't worry about it. <laughs> Tammy, did you have something you want to say? Yes, on the twenty twenty five year. We need to acknowledge the presence of income driven repayment and forgiveness timelines. So we see this as a one time action, but keep in mind we're still doing the one time account adjustment for borrowers in repayment. So for those borrowers, they would not see the clip. And on save, we looked at it, but we did not think we could incorporate it here. Can I just respond to that quickly? I think because the IDR account adjustment will not capture borrowers in default. So that will not be sufficient. Those borrowers will still have a longer period of time in repayment. And that is one of the things that I am especially distressed by considering that those borrowers have already demonstrated that they are distressed um, and are more likely to default again. Uh, so I would hope that the department would use this opportunity to clear those bad debts um, and to discharge them, especially when they've been in repayment for 20 or 25 years, but also if there are, are smaller loan balances as well. But I, I hear that the department is not considering the other piece, although I would urge it to reconsider that position. Okay. Thank you, Kira. I want to point out that uh, India Hexall has come to the table for civil rights organizations in place of um, Wisdom Coal. Welcome, India. Um, Yayo. Thank you. Um, so first of all, I, I want to uh, mirror what everyone has already said here, and, and I won't um, I won't burden you with saying it again. No, I, I, I want to flag something. One, the cliff is unnecessary, right? And, and though we argued for um, making this particular provision a provision that doesn't, uh, that's not a one-time provision, to the extent that the effort here is to really address sort of retroactively old loans and not um, prospectively, you can still achieve that without a cliff by creating a scenario where loans sort of come eligible on an annual basis for some period of years going forward. I look forward to seeing proposals um, that others sort of have to address this cliff because I think that it's it's unnecessary and will harm people. But also to um, to Kira's point, 
about the insufficiency of the one-time adjustment for folks in default, I do just want to flag that, you know, a lot of the, the time period that is covered that will not be covered by the reg text as drafted is a time period in which we know that there was an extreme amount of service or misconduct that resulted in people being pushed into, uh, into default who would not default if they were getting the advice that they should have been getting and if they understood the programs that the department had available at the time. And so it, one of the priorities, I think, of the department or that the department should have in this um, in this regulatory process is addressing those groups of borrowers, the borrowers who ended up in these difficult situations, who've been in these situations for a very long time and who really need relief and uh, to uh, sort of not provide that relief for this period of years where we have evidence and data of extreme service or misconduct seems like a real missed opportunity to the detriment of borrowers. So I do suggest that the department consider the regulatory proposals that it will receive to, um, to soften this cliff and to ensure that those borrowers in such critical need of relief receive it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jalil. Thank you. Um, I think that a part of what at least I would like to be on record is that 20 to 25 years is not necessary, that it is within the department's discretion to have um, a Way a wave authority applied to student debt balances um, without a borrower having to wait to 20 to 25 years. I understand that the department continues to respond that it has to acknowledge the repayment timelines already under IDR plans. We understand that, but we also understand, as Kira pointed out, that under SAVE, you carve out a different um, timeline for, for borrowers who have 12,000 or less. That's not simply because the student loan balance is small. It's because that's a group of borrowers who have been identified as distressed borrowers. So we know we also have distressed borrowers who, who are at a certain age, where we see from recent studies from the Federal Reserve that found that a borrower who is still in repayment when they are near retirement age is, does, is not experiencing the same or typical wage boost that we think a college graduate should have. We know that borrowers who have balances that are way above their principal are distressed. We know the borrowers who are Pell Grant recipients or parents of Pell Grant recipients show signs of distress. We have all these other markers of distress. So we're not saying ignore the timeline under, under IDR, but we're saying that you have already shown that you can carve out a timeline for distressed borrowers that doesn't sentence them to a lifetime debt sentence of distress of 20 to 25 years. You can offer uh, relief in a shorter amount of time. I also want to point out that many bar, many negotiators here have already sent in proposals with detailed regulatory texts, or at least evidence and research of how some regulatory texts could be curated to capture again the carve out that has a shorter timeline to cancellation, but also targeting already distressed borrowers. So I just want the department to understand that it's not about just saying let's throw out the twenty to twenty five years, but it's about acknowledging that you already have provided a pathway to relief for borrowers who are distressed and saying that it doesn't make sense to continue to try to extract and burden borrowers who likely cannot repay, have shown evidence they cannot repay, but and it doesn't make sense to make them have to sit under student debt for 20 to 25 years. So again, I encourage the department to return back to the proposals that have been submitted. I encourage the department to think about, again, that you are not required to hold borrowers for 20 to 25 years in a lifetime debt sentence. You have seconds remain. And I encourage you to use that power to offer relief here more broadly. Okay, thank you, Jewel. Uh, John Whitelaw. Just briefly, I want to certainly lift up everything that uh, Jaleel just said, but specifically want to talk about cliffs, especially when they're unnecessary. Cliffs undermine um, uh, credibility. They undermine confidence because on either side of the cliff, it's completely arbitrary. Um, yes, it matters where lines are drawn, but to the extent that you could avoid cliffs, uh, you really want to work exceptionally hard to avoid cliffs because it sets up two classes of people uh, which are indistinguishable in all but completely arbitrary ways. So you have the last person in and the first person out, and they look exactly the same. Uh, and particularly, you know, you only want to do cliffs if you absolutely have to. There has to be a way to avoid cliffs. Uh, because they just undermine credibility in the program because they set up arbitrary distinctions. And I have seen cliffs in operation for 30 years in the benefit context, and they're always a disaster. So let's see if we can not have a cliff on these things. Thank you, John. Jessica? Thanks. Um, I just 
I, I think that, you know, one of the reasons this proposal is so good is not, you know, it's absolutely about the borrowers that it helps, but I think it also has the potential to have a really beneficial spillover effect on the student loan system as a whole. Based on, you know, my experience working with clients, I think that, you know, the clients with loans from like 1986 or 1991 or, um, are often the ones who have the most complicated repayment histories. They're the ones who are least likely to be able to, you know, find documentation of what they have and haven't paid to have to go to the guarantee agency or the servicer or the prior guarantee agency or prior servicer um, to try and figure out who the holder is. Like, I think that, um, like these clients occupy like a disproportionate amount of the student loan resources. And I think that by sort of getting them off the books, it will allow servicers and other people who work with student loan borrowers, the ombudsman's office, to be able to sort of uh, focus, um, you know, a limited amount of resources on borrowers and give them, I, th I think, ideally better service. And to me, that's like a really an important reason to, to, to get rid of the cliff. I think, you know, if we're if if we really did that, I think you know that the, we're we're looking at a world where in I think what is it twenty twenty thirty five so we're only you know twelve years away from like essentially the phase out of the fell program. I think that that would um have some really good benefits for the sort of administrability of the student loan program as a whole. Um, and I would strongly encourage the department to think about those effects not just on individual borrowers but in the aggregate when considering whether to do this in the future. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Kira. I just want to add one additional point about potentially providing an additional provision that discharges the debts of uh, that have been in repayment for 10 years. Um, if they have if the borrower originally borrowed a principal of twelve thousand dollars um, and to get mirror the um, uh, gradual relief provisions of the save plan where the borrower has one more year of repayment time for, I believe it's one more $1,000 of additional principal debt, original debt. Um, in the department's analysis, it lifted up the fact that this disproportionately targets folks who have had one year of post-secondary schooling or less. Um, that includes folks who have been in short-term programs, but it also includes folks who didn't complete their program. Um, and the department's default data indicates that this is a population of folks who disproportionately default on their loans and are in distress um, on their loans. And it, that's particularly just distressing because people who did not complete do not have <laughs> higher wages. They do not have a, a better um, ability to repay their debt um, because of their schooling. Um, in addition, just broadly, we know that borrowers with smaller balances are more likely to default on their debt as well. Um, so considering a shorter repayment period for borrowers who have who took on smaller principles in the first place would disproportionately benefit borrowers in default and really target the distressed borrower population that the department is trying to target more broadly as well. Okay, thank you. Any further comment? Okay, seeing no further hands, it is 2.30. Um, Jalil. Yep, I do, I do, or I, I'm wondering if the department can speak to some of the, I think a lot of points have been raised here. I would like to hear the department just speak to some of these questions around, you know, the 20, 25 years, you know, how in other um, regulations, the stress has been, a justification to offer quicker relief, why that isn't being offered here when we're dealing with the age of loans. Um, so just wanted to hear the department speak back to some of the concerns that negotiators are raising, or at least provide some more context so that we can understand if you need more research, more evidence, more regulatory text as we prepare for tomorrow. Tammy? Yes. We plan to discuss this tomorrow, Jaleel. We only wanted to give an opportunity for you guys to give us some additional information to think about. Um, it was your, you know, the negotiator's suggestion that we open this up today to talk about it. And we will have more to say on this topic tomorrow. 
Um, but we still, you know, we still want to go back and change the few little pieces that we want to change and present at RegTex to you later this afternoon. Or this evening, excuse me. I mean, is it not possible? I'm assuming there's some part of this regulatory text that is not going to change overnight. So is it possible to provide more context of clarification around those pieces that are relevant to some of the issues being raised now? I think holistically, we're looking at 232 right now with our public comment starting at three. And um, there, we know that we received some proposals to eliminate the cliff and we know we are evaluating that regulatory text. And I don't believe that we have enough time with a break to really start the conversation on 3083. So we're gonna wait and have that conversation tomorrow. So you've given us a lot to think about we know that we've had proposals on this, so we're going to go back and we're going to review this this evening, and we'll circulate a mandatory text later this evening. Well, I'll let you get back. Okay, so. All right. Thank you, Tammy. Let me get back on it. All right, so it is 2.33. Um, let's go ahead and take... Um, a 15 minute break and be back in time so that we can start public comment um, directly at three o'clock. We do have a full list for that as well as a waiting list. Jessica, one last comment before break. Yeah, it sounds like we're not gonna do the felt today, which is fine. I just wanted to um, make sure that you saw my comment in the chat that I would strongly encourage the department just to change the title of that to indicate that it is does not apply to department held felt it just as you're considering things tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks. Cindy, would it be possible mm -hmm. for us to go ahead and just take the break until about 10 till? Yes. Yes. Let's do that. All right. that so way we'll be back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll be back at 10 minutes to three so we can uh, get organized and start. So with that, um, see you in about 22 minutes or so.
Okay, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so a couple things in the seven minutes we have left. One, I'd like to remind those who have signed up and have um, time slots for the public speaking to sign in about 15 minutes prior to your time slot so that we can keep on schedule. Um, so um, go ahead and start doing that and pay attention to your time slot for those on the waiting list. Um, you can sign in as well, but we will um, take those in the time slots allotted um, prior to moving on. So with that, I'd like to open it up one last time for comments from the negotiators to the department. Um, Richard? Yeah, I had a quick question. I just didn't know when this would come up. Uh, one of the proposal items that I had submitted was uh, about the joint spousal consolidation. And when we received our return phone calls from the department, I was told that that was something that the department hoped to address during these neg regs. So I'm not sure if I, I missed them in the uh, amended text that we received, or if that is something that the department intends to bring up during discussions of hardship at the end of the day tomorrow. But I, I did just want to follow up because uh, I was received that phone call and was hopeful that that was a good sign. Um, we do plan to discuss the proposals, all the rest of the proposals that we haven't mentioned throughout today. As we navigate through tomorrow, we'll mention the rest of those. And as a part of hardship, we will discuss the spousal consolidation issue that you brought up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments? Again, a reminder to the um, people signed up for public comment, please sign yes. in about 15 minutes before your time slot. Those of you who have immediate ones coming up, please get signed in, logged in. Please um, make sure that your name when you log in matches what you signed up for and is not just your first name, um, as we have several people with the same first name. So we want to make sure that we're um, calling on the uh, correct person at the right time. So all right. One last call for any comments at all. Ashley? Um, this is a little off topic pop top uh, topic, but I'm gonna bring it up just because I keep getting um a whole bunch of emails and DMs over it throughout the day. Um, it looks like there are several Sweet versus Cardona um, class members who are having their credit reports report inaccurate information. Um, so I just wanted to bring this up since I have the attention of the department. Um, that this Ashley, seems to be an if ongoing you would, problem. If you would let those individuals know that they can reach out to our ombudsman office, okay, that would be helpful. Yeah. Okay, I will let Thank them know you. if I look them up. Okay, thank you. All right, final call for last thoughts to the department prior to going into public comment that you would like them to consider um, or and think about uh, as they draft um, the text to send to you for tomorrow's discussions. Okay. I'm going to make one last plea to people who have signed up for public comment to please log in if your time is near within 15 minutes or so. Um, at least sign in um, those of you later on down the time frame. Please sign in at least 15 minutes ahead of time so that uh, we can get you situated and get you in. Um, we've got about two minutes prior to the start. So in about a minute, we're gonna let the first guest in and we're gonna move through the list of those who have logged into the meeting and um, let you address the committee.
All right, Brady, you want to bring in our first uh, guest and get situated and we'll get moving here? Yep, absolutely. I just admitted Virgilio Lasaga, who is here representing themselves. Okay, welcome. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Um, thanks for joining uh, the committee for comment today. You will have three minutes to present your um, comments to the committee, and you will be given a 30-second uh, reminder of when your time is almost up, okay? Awesome, thank you so, so much. So with that, go ahead and start. Yeah, so my name is Vigilio Lasaga. I would like to address two areas of consideration for hardship discussions tomorrow, with the first being in relation to Pell Grant recipients, and the second in relation to borrowers with disabilities. Uh, to give you a bit of my backstory, I received federal loans as a poverty level low income borrower. I was nearly a first generation college student uh, with my parent graduating one year prior to me receiving my four year degree. I graduated with an associate's degree from my community college, transferred to a four year public university and then completed a one year master's degree from the same university. Throughout my college tenure, I along with other members of my family received full Pell Grant benefits due to our exceptionally low income. I also qualified for and participated in work study during my time in college. Because I received Pell Grant, I was disqualified from receiving food stamps, and this is an attestment to loans being necessary for low-income borrowers beyond the scope of tuition, as loans help provide food, housing, utilities, um, and other expenses. Despite making a decent wage now, about four years after graduation, I still lack financial stability due to the insufficient income of my family. Um, my family lacks generational wealth, and I often have to help my family with necessities, necessities such as medication, insurance payments, utility bills, and food. Additionally, very few members of my family will be able to retire as most of them are unable to save for retirement because they're living paycheck to paycheck. I'm currently not able to save to purchase a home, cannot afford to start a family, and cannot afford the expense of purchasing a used vehicle. I would like to urge the committee to take into consideration the likelihood of continued hardship for current and once low-income borrowers, especially those who've received Pell Grant. Automatic qualifiers for hardship could be based on multiple years of Pell Grant eligibility combined with the amount they were eligible for based on their income. Another automatic qualifier could be um, based on Pell Grant recipients who were in households with multiple family members who received Pell Grant. Again, gauging this based on the amount of the grant they were qualified for. Um, for hardship qualifiers that would require manual review, please consider developing a mechanism that considers the age of borrowers and their annual income against the retirement savings. So for an example, having saved one year annual salary by age 30. I'd also like to suggest the consideration of hardship for individuals with disabilities. While Social Security most certainly should be used for determining hardship, there are a lot of people with disabilities who want to work and wouldn't qualify for Social Security otherwise. Um, I would encourage the development of a mechanism that utilizes federally funded state vocational rehabilitation programs to determine eligibility for hardship. Vocational rehabilitation is equipped to categorize the significance of individuals' disabilities as it relates to their functional capabilities for empl employment. An application that can be submitted by a vocational rehabilitation counselor might suffice as it provides an opportunity to receive Hello, vetted, 30 seconds. Thank you. Receive vetted information about the income or potential income of an individual with a disability and to determine if their student loan creates a hardship based on that individual's potential gainful employment. Um, I would like to thank everyone on the committee for your, your time and input throughout this process and to the federal workers who made this possible. I really, truly, greatly appreciate the opportunity to provide my perspective. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Brady, who is next? All right. I just admitted Stephen Patterson, who serves as the executive director of the Veterans Education Project. Hey, good afternoon, Mr. Patterson. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. You will have um, three minutes to address the committee with your comments. You will be given a 30-second uh, reminder that your time is almost up. And with that, your time starts now. Thanks. My name uh, is Steve Patterson. I served uh, in the United States Air Force and the Executive Director for the Veterans Education Project, or uh, VEP. Uh, VEP is committed to supporting service members and veterans in their academic pursuits, and I appreciate the time uh, to represent their needs in, to the negotiating committee. I recognize that this uh, uh, rulemaking is focused on the Department of Education Student Loan Debt Relief Plan, and many might question how this involves veterans. In, in fact, many service members and veterans uh, do ac access federal loans on top of their educational benefits. I'm concerned that this negotiation has not given sufficient consideration to those individuals and the circumstances surrounding their borrowing. We are grateful to the department's efforts to make education more accessible and affordable for our veterans. However, it is critical that we also engage in thoughtful examination of student veteran debt and data and the impact of all potential outcomes of large-scale debt forgiveness on veterans. 
I highlight for you three primary concerns. First, I would ask that the department and the negotiators pay particular attention to the borrowing needs of service members and veterans. There's a need to examine current data on student veteran borrowing. While it is common for many veterans to receive full educational benefits covering the totality of their educational costs, there is nothing that prevents them from borrowing even more on top of that. And we must be cautious not to create a system that inadvertently incentivizes veterans to take on unnecessary debt. The focus should be on providing avenues for education that do not uh, perpetuate a cycle of borrowing, but instead empower veterans to build a prosperous future without shouldering undue financial strain. Second, within the context of this negotiation, the effort to identify avenues for loan forgiveness, I would ask that the department expand section 30.80 to include waivers for veteran specific uh, conditions and contexts. Third, and importantly, I am compelled to raise an issue that extends beyond the corners of this negotiation. As the department expands loan forgiveness and creates a programs that provide for free or near free education, there's a sense by many that uh, you might be undermining the value of the GI Bill and other service-related educational benefits. These benefits are not just financial incentives, they are a promise made to those who serve that their commitment will be met with opportunities for personal and professional growth through education. Undermining the value of these benefits could have far-reaching consequences, namely increased negative impact on already declining military recruitment. Educational benefits are consistently among the top reasons a person joins the military. Our commitment to supporting veterans must extend beyond financial relief and must uphold the integrity of the promises made to those who have served. With all politics aside, we encourage the department to consider the student veterans and how often- Steve, well, you had 30 seconds. How often well-intentioned legislation has unintended uh, impacts on our heroes. We know education has the power to help veterans thrive in their post-service lives. It is therefore vital that we scrutinize and minimize potential negative impacts policies will have on our current and future heroes. We encourage the department to continue to work to bring down the cost of education, increasing institutional accountability, and decrease student debt amongst the military and veteran community, all while retaining the impact and integrity of their educational benefits. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Steve, and thank you for your service. Thank you. Brady, who is next, please? All right, I just submitted James Alden, uh, who's representing himself. I think he's all connected. Okay. James, can you hear me? I can hear you. Wonderful. All right, um, you will have three minutes to address the committee with your comments. You will receive a 30 second reminder that your time is almost up. Okay. And with that, your time begins now. Hey, thank you so much for allowing me to speak here today. Um, to get a uh, a degree in, in college was never a, a dream of mine uh, growing up, but I thought when I graduated high school, going to Catherine Gibbs School, uh, formerly known as Sanford Brown, I uh, thought that was my only path to getting a college education. Shortly after I graduated from Sanford Brown, I realized that the, uh, the degree that I got was not um, valuable at, at all. So when I had to pay back the, the loans and stuff, I realized that the, uh, when I went to on-job interviews, I didn't really have um, the, the, the skill set that they promised me to do. So I had to enroll in Johnson Wales University continuing education program. To do that, we had to refinance my house and uh, pay off the debts from um, Sanford Brown. Uh, throughout that time, uh, I've received uh, my associate's degree through Johnson & Wales University. I've been trying to rectify the, pro uh, the problem that I had with Sanford Brown. And uh, one of the remedies that I hope uh, the committee will take into consideration is, is if you paid off your loans with um, uh, a for-profit school that I wouldn't say was very deceitful, that they would consider um, a, pro uh, a proven uh, or um, relieving student uh, debts for somebody had to go to Johnson Wales or a different university for being deceived by the previous uh, school. So um, I've tried numerous uh, tactics to go through the Bauer Defense uh, program, uh, been denied. I didn't know, realize that Cardona versus Sweet was uh, an option until later on when I tried to apply, it was. Uh, denied. So I just hope that the situation can be rectified for myself and many other people who went to school thinking that they were going to receive an education because they didn't really get have the great high school education or they have learning disabilities. And then they had to go back and to um, receive another education. So I'm pretty much 
even though we refinance our home, I'm pretty much stuck for sixty thousand dollars with the debt that we've incurred. So, um, James, thirty seconds remains. So I'm gonna. Uh, I just hope that uh, my comments will uh, draw a change, and I appreciate everything that you guys do. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Brady. Next up, um, I just admitted uh, Lisa Harrell, who's here representing herself. Hi, Lisa. Can you hear me? Well, audio and video are connected, so she should be able to hear you. Lisa, can you hear me? Well, Lisa, you are muted right now in case that's the issue. I'm sorry. It's okay. Okay, Lisa. Hi. Uh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> you, uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon. You have three minutes to address the committee, and you will be given a 30-second notice just before your time is to expire. So with that, your time begins now. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Lisa Harrell. Thank you very much for taking the time to hear me. Um, I am a registered nurse and I attended Kaplan University and I also filed a BDTR um, on 9-10 of 2022. I also am administrator of a Kaplan um, and Purdue Global Bars Defense. Um, Facebook group um, where we are, you know, just a, a group that um, is joined together because we all have the same, same complaints about Kaplan, um, different experiences. Um, I went, I attended Kaplan University um, from 2011, um, at which time my son had passed away um, previously. And for probably a, about a year, I really went through a really tough time and I went to work and basically was non-existent. And then I decided to go back to school. That was my, um, my goal because I had to keep my mind occupied. I was going through a lot at that time. So I wanted to go to an online program that offered me because I was a full-time working person and needed that for, you know, for me. So um, I spoke to an advisor who at the time was very empathetic to my needs, explained to him, you know, my situation and that, you know, I wanted to, you know, further my degree. At that time, you needed to have a BSN to work in the hospitals. So I needed to get that anyway. And so the advisor that I spoke to, you know, assured me why I should choose Kaplan. And I remember his words like they were yesterday. Um, Kaplan University has a great academic program. They, we have especially um, very good connections with, um, for job placement, um, we offer that. That's part of our career services. He gave me job placement rates of 94%, all our graduates. So 30 seconds remains. Thank you. So with that, um, Kaplan was sold to Purdue for uh, $1 in 2018. I went back into, in October um, 2017, finished my degree, um, and then I was hit with uh, 90, 000, like $80,000 plus interest in student loans. I Time. almost, thank you. Thank you for sharing with us, Lisa. Brady, thank who's you. next? Well, Cindy, I just admitted Representative Ayanna Presley, who represents the seventh district of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Hey. Representative Presley, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you Wonderful. hear me? Wonderful. Yes, thank you. Um, welcome. You will have three minutes to address the committee. Um, we will give you a 30 second reminder just before your time is to expire. So with that, your time begins now. Good afternoon. I'm Congresswoman Ayanna Presley. I represent the Massachusetts 7th, a vibrant, dynamic and diverse congressional district that is also one of the most unequal. 
We're in a three mile radius from Cambridge to predominantly black Roxbury. Median household income drops by $50,000 and life expectancy by 30 years. Addressing these inju injustices brought me to Congress in much of the same way addressing the injustice of student loan debt brought you all to this committee. I applaud the committee for its dedication to confronting the nearly $2 trillion crisis that burdens 43 million people in the United States. Last week, I joined my colleagues in the House of Representatives and Senate in a comment letter urging that the current NEG-REG process result in providing the full-scale debt relief that low- and middle-income income borrowers urgently need. We detail concrete ways to draft the final rule that delivers for the American people, and I hope the committee gives our recommendations the close consideration they deserve. The 76-year-old grandmother still paying on student loans. The elementary school educators struggling to repay their student debt on a teacher's income. The iron worker who is losing a slice of their union paycheck to student loan repayment. And the young family balancing the skyrocketing costs of child care rent and student loans. The people in my district and millions of others have their eyes on this committee, and it is essential that they benefit from student loan debt relief. Last year, President Biden's plan to cancel up to $20,000 in student debt for borrowers offered so much hope to people that believed they would never be able to start a family, open a business, or to achieve financial stability. The reach and impact of that historic plan should be the bare minimum of what the Department of Education produces. Despite the Supreme Court's cruel and callous obstruction, statutory authority of the Higher Education Act should embolden this committee to do all that it can to ensure everyone experiencing financial hardship receives relief. And we must recognize the very need to take out student debt in order to attain a degree is in and of itself a financial hardship. In the United States, we refer to education as the great equalizer, but we place barriers in the ways of families accessing education. Black and Latinx students have to borrow at higher rates that take longer for them to pay, leaving communities of color holding a disproportionate share of the nation's student debt burden. Students with an unexpected family contribution of zero dollars. Representative, 30 seconds remain. Should not be punished for doing the very thing our society encouraged them to do and pursue higher education. The $2 trillion burden of student debt is a national crisis that demands a bold, transformative response. Like millions of others, I took out student loans to attend college. It took me over 20 years to pay them off. I was a caregiver to my mother. I worked multiple jobs. And at one point, my own loans were in default. My story is not an anomaly. And far too many have experienced a similar struggle. Borrowers demand and deserve student debt cancellation. President Biden promised student debt cancellation. Time. And this committee must deliver. Thank you. Um, Brady, next. All right. I just admitted uh, Kayla Lightfoot, who is here on behalf of the University of Mary Washington chapter, chapter of the NAACP. Okay. Welcome, Kayla. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful. You will have three minutes to address the committee with a 30-second reminder that your time is almost up. So with that, your time begins now. Good, e good evening, everyone. My name is Kayla Lightfoot. I am the secretary of the NACP College Chapter of the University of Mary Washington. And on the behalf of this case, I wanted to remind that this is like my personal story. I understand that this impacts quite a few people in my family, if not the entire generation to come. Uh, but for starters, I am currently a Pell Grant recipient while also being an out-of-state student. Um, due to those matters, it's important to address that like the FAFSA was not enough in my um ability to like fully afford school. So it's important to address that when it comes to student debt relief, it would be great to have that alleviated in the process. Um, and doing so, I think it's great to address that um, through this alleviation that the student debt has a huge impact on my life as pertains, I do have future aspirations for law school. And as it continues on that a burden of student debt has impacted not only myself, but also my family who also has a plethora of other children who also have his perspective to go to college as well. But as like my personal story, I think it's also important to have understand that the impact on my life is about the ability to afford a car, um, owning a house, but even just having the fundamental necessities after college um, and deciding how to make important decisions and possibly living with my own family instead of having the luxury of being able to independently live on my own. And, and, and understand that the rate of me being an out-of-state student is completely different than being an in-state student and currently going through that process. I think it's important to address that 
out-of-state students are are significantly disenfranchised in this process of student loans, everything else um, in the process, and understanding that the significant background of like Pell Grants, being a Pell Grant recipient has made it very difficult in doing so. So I just wanna say thank you. Hey, thank you, Kayla. Brady, um, who is next? All right, I just admitted uh, Barbara Davis, who is here representing herself. It looks like we're waiting for her to turn her audio on. There we go. Hi. Hi, Barbara, Hi. can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Um, well, thank you for joining the committee this afternoon. You will have three minutes to address them with your comments. You will receive a 30 second notice of your time almost expiring. So with that, you can uh, go ahead and start now. Okay, my name is Barbara Davis. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I first uh, consolidated my uh, student loans in uh, 1989. Um, it was a little over $10,000 at that time. Um, I had Sally May for several years who had a fixed rate, which was kind of high. I did have some forbearances. So by 2013, I was trying to get away from Sally May um, and I managed to reconsolidate. I've been income driven the entire time. Um, so now it's 2023. So it's been 34 years later and I now owe over $19,000 when I initially only borrowed 10,000. Um, and it, for whatever reason, the system is only showing that, uh, it was dispersed in 20. 13, because that's when I reconsolidated to get away from Sally Mae, who, by the way, I was given right back to Sally Mae at a lower interest rate, but then, of course, it's been sold several times since then. So I spend way over 25 years of income driven, but I'm kind of stuck. Uh, people keep telling me, well, you reconsolidated in 2013. So, you know, you started from scratch and I owe almost twice as much as I initially borrowed. Um, just kind of a little frustrated, can't, can't seem to jump through the loopholes of whatever I need to do. Um, but that's where I'm at right now. Okay, thank you, Barbara. We um, appreciate you addressing the committee with your concerns. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome, have a nice day. Brady? All right, I just admitted uh, Stephen Minacostri, who is here representing himself. Okay, Stephen, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Okay. You will have three minutes to address the committee this afternoon, and uh, they appreciate you being here. Uh, you will receive a 30-second notice prior to your time expiring. So with that, your time will begin now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Manicastri, and I'm sharing my family's story. When federal student loan payments were paused in 2020, my wife and I could finally plan for our future. We saved up money to purchase our first starter home in February of 2022 and gave birth to our daughter that September. When President Biden announced his plan for student debt relief, my wife and I applied, were approved, and would have saved a total of $30,000 on our federal student loans. The plan wouldn't have wiped out our federal student loan debt, but it would have halved it. My wife and I relied on President Biden's cancellation plan and the life-changing impact that would have made. We planned around it, with my wife leaving her job to bond with our daughter until she turned one. Unfortunately, because of the Supreme Court's partisan decision to find this debt relief program unconstitutional, my wife had to return to work sooner than anticipated, and we now both work full-time, relying on our families to help plug in the holes in coverage with our daughter. With the resumption of payments and no student debt forgiveness in sight, we now spend about $1,500 a month on both private and federal student loans. When you factor in a mortgage, medical bills, food, and unpredictable expenses with a new baby, it doesn't leave much room for error. And I say this knowing how lucky we've gotten to have even been able to afford to own a small condo and to have a baby. So many of our friends have not been as lucky. But that's the problem. Student loan debt is a systemic issue that strangleholds millions of us. Having the outside inside perspective of a naturalized citizen, we are one of the few countries on earth that don't offer services like universal health care and free higher education. It's beyond deplorable to witness our taxes fund imperialist projects such as Israel's genocidal campaign on Palestinians instead of providing basic services to our people. I made all the right moves to keep my debt low while getting an education. I went to a community college and a public university on a scholarship to obtain my bachelor's. I worked full time and commuted to keep costs down. I went to grad school at a public university to get my doctorates. 
and made starvation wages as a teaching assistant until we formed our graduate employee union, UAW Local 6950. I accumulated my federal student loan debt in grad school prior to our first union contract because it was impossible to live in Connecticut on $15,000 a year before taxes. Both my wife and I have been penalized for pursuing a higher education. We both chose careers of service. She's a registered nurse and I work for a labor union representing public sector em employees who are all eligible to apply for the public service loan forgiveness program. The irony is not lost on me that while the members that I dedicate my time fighting for on the job can apply for this program, I'm carved out of it because I work for a labor union. It would have given us the opportunity, um, this debt relief program would have given us the opportunity. Uh, Stephen, to, 30 seconds remains. Thank you. It would have given us the opportunity to raise our daughter without the same level of financial stress and anxiety we both grew up in. Instead, we are now poorer than our parents. The Biden administration has the legal authority to effectuate a no-means testing, uh, uh, no testing debt relief program that is immediate for all those who hold federal student loans. This administration has an obligation to all of us to uphold their promise immediately. Thank you, and cease firing Delza now. I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. We appreciate your time. Um, before, uh, you can let the next person in, Brady, but I want to remind people to please uh, log in about 15 minutes before your scheduled time. And those who are on the waiting list, um, please uh, go ahead and um, log in um, close to the uh, 345 time mark um, or a little before would be great. Also, please, um, when you log in, make sure your name matches what you signed up and registered under. We can't identify people. We can't let them in. So um, please uh, go in and change your name so that we can clearly identify you. Who do we have next? Uh, Cindy, I believe I just admitted Senator Elizabeth Warren, who serves as the senior senator of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Okay, Senator Warren, can you hear me? Senator Warren? See her in the uh, the list, but she is on mute in case that's the issue. Okay, hey, Senator Warren, I believe you are on mute. If you could unmute yourself. Oh, they just messaged that they're having a technical hiccup and they'll, they'll be okay. ready to speak in a few minutes. Would you like me to admit the next yeah. speaker? Yes, please. Okay, uh, I'm admitting uh, Leandra Bridgewaters, who is here speaking on behalf of the NAACP. Okay. Leandra, can you hear me? connecting to audio. Leandro, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I can hear you. Wonderful. Um, thanks for joining the committee this afternoon. You will have three minutes to address the committee with your comments. You will receive a 30-second notice that your time is about to expire. So with that, your time begins now. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Leandra Bridgewaters, a student loan borrower. Thank you all for your time and for listening to my comments as you all work diligently to establish a rule for modifying federal student loans. As a first generation college student, my unwavering aspiration was to return to school, motivated to gain knowledge, establish financial stability, and serve as a role model for my ch two children. I opted to return to college and acquire a bachelor's degree in psychology where I was a Pell Grant recipient. Having completed my bachelor's degree merely served as a foundational step. As a result, I felt obligated to further my education, so I pursued my master's degree in social work and became a mental health therapist. Due to the financial aid structure and limitations on grants and loan amounts, my two children did not receive enough student aid to cover the cost of their college education. As a concerned mother, I could not risk depriving them of a chance to obtain an education, so I took out a Parent PLUS loan to assist my children. My daughter is now in her third year of medical school. She has generated over $180,000 in student loan, thus far continuing the generational cycle of student loan debt for, black, for the Black community. I'm currently enrolled in my final semester of doctoral studies while continuing to pursue a sustainable career and obtain financial stability. I owe around $130,000 in student loan and a graduate loan that I had to take out this past summer. This debt will prevent me from purchasing a home and other real estate, uh, preventing my family from amassing wealth. 
In addition, I anticipate an enormous monthly payment that I may not be able to afford when I complete my courses in 2024. The ramifications of student debt extend beyond the borrowers themselves, impeding one's capacity to participate in the labor market and prosper in today's market. Acquiring education is a paramount concern for African Americans, but the burden of student loan debt has emerged as a significant obstacle to their economic advancement. Counseling student loan debt for up to $50,000 would benefit the Black community by an overwhelming margin, especially Black women. In addition, I want to emphasize that while we welcome the saving on value, value Andrew, you have 30 seconds left. Replayment plan. It is critical that the Biden administration must not leave out borrowers who pursued graduate education or supported their children in assessing higher education like me. And suing adjustments to fix the student loan must include graduate and parent plus borrowers and benefit everyone equally uh, from such adjustments. Again, thank you for your time and diligent work you are doing on this social justice concern. Thank you very much, Leandra, for addressing the committee this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, Brady, where are we now? Uh, I just admitted uh, Arnold Sowell, who serves as the executive director of Next Gen Policy. Good afternoon, Arnold. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me, please? Yes, yes. You will have uh, three minutes to address the committee with 30-second um, notice when your time's about to expire. So with that, your time begins now. And welcome, Senator Warren. You will be up next. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and good afternoon. My name is Arnie Sowell, and as was mentioned, I'm the executive director of NextGen California. Uh, and NextGen is a nonprofit organization that's based in California, and we advocate uh, for um, uh, progressive policy change across a range of areas, uh, environmental, social, racial, and economic. Um, and that includes advocating and fighting for college afford making college more affordable and ending uh, the student debt crisis. Uh, and I just want to thank uh, thank you again for taking the time uh, to take public comment, uh, particularly as you're about to finalize this rule as it relates to uh, the modification or um, waiver of uh, as it relates to federal student loans. Um, I just also note on a personal side that I'm the the father of three children, and uh, all my kids have graduated from college at this uh, at this point. But we as a family had to take out uh, student loan debt. And uh, my kids are in various stages of repayment, either through the public service uh, uh, loan forgiveness program or other income-based uh, uh, repayment uh, programs. Uh, I would also just note that in uh, my job, uh, many of my colleagues uh, have student loan debt, uh, both uh, here at the, the nonprofit I work for and also at um, and the state legislature. And one of the things that we pride ourselves in here is that uh, we've conducted a number of student loan workshops that try to assist uh, thousands of Californians in terms of answering their questions about the student loan uh, sort of landscape and presenting the, the latest information on uh, how they can receive uh, technical assistance. Um, uh, specifically, uh, I would just note that President Biden's original plan to cancel student debt uh, in the amounts of $10,000 and $20,000 for Pell Grant recipients uh, should just be the start, not the ceiling for broad-based uh, student debt cancellation. Canceling up to 50,000 in student debt would significantly reduce the racial wealth gap, secure economic mobility for communities historically marginalized, and lift the burden of the student debt crisis uh, for millions across America. Uh, in California, we know that the president's original plan would have eliminated almost $26 billion in debt for over uh, 2 million uh, Californians. In a state like ours, where the cost of living is commonly uh, high in many regions, this debt forgiveness would have been a Arnold, 30 seconds uh, remains. moment for many borrowers and families, especially as our lowest income communities are struggling with the uh, still to, to, to uh, in the aftermath of the COVID epidemic. And I just want to applaud you for all your work and just uh, uh, would uh, continue to urge you uh, to fix the student loan system so that it includes graduate borrowers and parent plus borrowers. And I thank you. Thank you, Arnold. We appreciate your time today. Senator Warren, thank you for being patient. You have the three minutes as well with a 30 second reminder. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, I'm so glad to be here today because this committee has an extraordinary opportunity to reduce crushing student debt for tens of millions of Americans. 
based on the current draft rule, as I read it, I believe we can and that we should do more. So I've got six recommendations to give the committee that I hope will help more borrowers who need it. First, I understand that you're trying to deal with the problem of people who are upside down on their debt. That is, they owe more now than they originally borrowed. Um, but you're talking about capping how much help those people get. So here's my first recommendation. The rule should eliminate all debt that exceeds borrower's original principal. Capping relief from runaway interest at $10,000 or $20,000 ties the secretary's hands unnecessarily. ED should be able to give meaningful relief to the nurse or the teacher with an expensive degree, someone who's made steady loan payments but who can't even afford to cover the interest and now owes more than she originally borrowed. Related to that, if you're taking on this question of excess interest, consider providing full cancellation of all of the excess interest for anyone who has paid back enough to cover their entire original loan amount and who is still in debt simply because of the interest. Third, let's go to a different area, and that is please eliminate the cliff that gives relief to borrowers who entered repayment by 2000 or 2005, but literally no relief to borrowers who started their repayment even a day later. If a borrower has 20 years or 25 years of repayment, give them help. And if they don't get 25 years until next month, give them help next month or the next month on a rolling basis. Fourth, add a provision for financial hardship. Let people apply directly by showing hardship. They could do that based, for example, on a high debt to income ratio or the need to care for a severely disabled family member. The rule could name indicators of hardship that could Senator, qualify for remains. someone in relief. Thank you. And it should also include a catch-all provision for other forms of hardship. Fifth, extend relief to borrowers who've been victims of misconduct by loan servicers. Students who are cheated by their schools got relief. The same should be true for borrowers cheated by their loan servicers. And last one, please make relief easy to access. As much as possible, base relief on information that ED already has like someone is a Pell Grant recipient or Time. income data they can get. Thank you all for all you're trying to do. And thank you for letting me come and talk with you today. Thank you. All right, Cindy, I just admitted uh, Catherine Craffey, who is here on behalf of the Spousal Consolidation Organization, Do Us Part. It looks like she's taking a seat right now. Like someone is a Pell Grant recipient. Or Evan, would you mind turning off the uh, the live? Yeah, I'm yes. leaving that. Yeah. All right. It would help if I was not on mute myself. Catherine, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Oh, okay, great. Um, well, welcome to uh, the public comment. Uh, you have three minutes to address the committee this afternoon. You will receive a 30 second uh, notice that your time is about to expire. So with that, your three minutes begins now. Okay, thank you for your time today. I represent the Spousal Consolidation Loans Do Us Part organization. We are calling on the secretary to use his authority granted in HEA 432A to cancel the remaining joint consolidation loans. Public Law 117-200 came to fruition in October 2022. After years of experiencing hardships under a dismantled loan program, we had hope, an emotion many of us are hesitant to believe in. Once again, our hope dwindles. I'm a first-gen college student that saw education out of, as a way out of poverty-stricken, abusive environment and was completely on my own. I worked 35 to 40 hours per week and qualified for the Pell, but still needed to rely on loans to fully pay for my education and avoid homelessness. When we consolidated our loans at the advisement of the servicer, I brought the largest portion. Since 2009, I have worked in public service at a community college. While this work is rewarding, I sacrifice earning potential in my field. 
The inability to separate despite the law continues to cause undue hardship on my family. As we raise two children and look toward retirement, these loans continue to keep us living paycheck to paycheck, and we are not alone. Nearly two thirds of the JCL borrowers have been in IDR repayment for more than 10 years. Over half of them continue to see negative amortization. Additionally, two thirds have paid more than the original balance of their loans. 30% have paid more than 150% of that original balance, and half of the members still owe more than their original loan balance. We range from ages 40 to 70, with nearly half between 50 to 70 years old. But that's not all. Our members continue to be locked out of options available to others. 91% have dedicated their lives to public service but cannot access PSLF, even though 83% have greater than 10 years of qualifying payments. My husband and I still owe nearly our entire balance. This is an atrocity. The statistics above show a dysfunctional and criminal situation in which hardworking, tax-paying people are shackled relentlessly to a dead loan program consistently forgotten, even with a recent law. This group wholly falls under undue hardship. Again, we are calling on the secretary to use his authority to cancel the remaining joint consolidation loans. Discharging these loans will save the Department of Education the administrative costs and burden tied to disentangling a very nuanced Catherine, you have 30 seconds left. A very nuanced set of loans that makes separation complex and nearly impossible. We've been misled, forgotten, and pushed to the side long enough. It's time to do the right thing. No other loan granting agency could get away with this type of neglectful administration of loans. And with that, I yield my time. Thank you, Catherine. We appreciate your time this afternoon. Um, we do have uh, three people who have signed in via a phone number. Uh, if we can't confirm the phone number, we're unable to let you in. So if you are listening on the live broadcast, please email the uh, uh, to confirm your phone numbers um, so that we can identify who you are. Thank you. Uh, Brady, who's next? All right. I just uh, admitted Siobhan Murray, who is a Master's of Fine Arts candidate at ASU. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome. You, you. Will have, you, you're so welcome. You have three minutes to address the committee this afternoon with a 30 second uh, notice that your time is about to expire. So with that, your three minutes begin now. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Siobhan Murray, and I'm a student loan borrower. I want to first thank the Department of Education for taking the time to listen to my testimony. I graduated from Salisbury University on the Eastern Shore of Maryland this year with my bachelor's. I'm from Maryland, so I selected Salisbury University because it was an in-state school where I could receive Pell Grants every year, as well as assistance from the MDCAPS program. <clears throat> for the first two years, my father paid for my college education. During my junior and senior years, I worked during the summers as a server and as a writing tutor during the semester. Despite my father's help and many hours spent working to pay my tuition and receiving over $15,000 in Pell Grants, I graduated with around $12,000 in student loans. If I were to attend an out-of-state school, I can't begin to imagine the cost of my loans. My sister attended, attended Howard University, which was out-of-state, and graduated with around $45,000 in student loans. Now that I've graduated, I've moved to Arizona State University to work as a teaching assistant and earn my Master's of Fine Arts. I have received a tuition waiver and a stipend because I'm a teaching assistant. Despite this, my stipend is roughly half of what the cost of living in Arizona is. Although I have a driver's license, I'm unable to afford a car. Arizona has some public transportation, but it is far from walkable, and I have faced many challenges from relying on public transportation, from sexual harassment to missing networking opportunities. I have $100 in my checkings account right now, so if I were to have an emergency, I would have nothing. I will have to pay thousands of dollars for my undergraduate years once I earn my master's. When the Pell Grant program was established in 1972, it was created to give students without financial resources the same means to pay for college as those with financial resources to pay for college. My story represents many low-income students who are faced with the rising cost of education at universities, both in and out of state, that can no longer compensate for these inequities. A long-term student loan forgiveness plan would allow me to save money for my future and buy a car. An equitable path to education should account for students like me 
black and brown students from low income families to close the racial wealth gap. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your time this afternoon. Brady, and who do we have next? All right, uh, I just admitted Danielle Pierce, who is here representing herself, who's joining us by phone. Okay, Danielle. Hi, can yes, you hear me? I'm here. Good afternoon. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, you will have three minutes to um, address the committee. And uh, with a 30 second reminder that your time is about up. So with that, your time begins now. Okay, good afternoon. My name is Danielle Pierce. I graduated in 2018 with a bachelor's degree in animal science. My graduation celebration was short lived when I received notice of having to make my first payment immediately after graduation. That sent me into panic mode. I didn't have a job at the time and my first payment was due. I wasn't sure how I was going to pay the money back then or now. Student loans have hindered me from having what many call the American dream. I have a desire to get my master's so I can fulfill my dreams of becoming a veterinarian but I'm unable to do so. The degree I have, I can't even get a well-paying job unless I get at least a master's, master's degree. And vet techs are often underpaid while minimum wage is still $7.25 an hour in South Carolina since 2008, which isn't enough to pay off my loans. Most scholarships are catered toward undergrad students and high school seniors. So getting a scholarship to go to grad school is far and few between. I currently live at home with my parents because I have to make a choice of having a roof over my head and food on the table or have that sense of independence and move out while being on the brink of homelessness, having bad credit and or missing a meal while trying to pay off student loans. I don't have rich parents and I'm not a lawmaker's daughter or granddaughter to where I don't have to worry about student loans hanging over my head. I have a total of $100,000 in student loans, 32,000 of that are federal and the rest are private. There are 43.6 million people in the U.S. with student loans. In layman's terms, that's one in five adults. Over 50% are African Americans. My parents help me as much as they can, but they shouldn't have to, especially being that my parents are almost 70. They shouldn't have to carry that burden nor watch their child suffer. I make payments as best as I can, taking most of my paycheck, but it's still not enough to make a dent in my loans. I'm very swamped, overwhelmed, and feel buried by loans, much like the rest of the U.S. The lawmakers who don't care are only worried about themselves and not the 43.6 million people who suffer daily. While their children and grandchildren won't have to worry about ever seeing a student loan or feeling burdened by it. At least 22 countries have made college free, but yet the U.S. is behind when it comes to that and instead have adults drowning in student loan debt. When taking this decision into consideration, think about how different your life would be if the shoe was on the other foot. And think about if you had student loans, would you barely be making ends meet? Think of the 43 Danielle, you have 30 seconds lives left. you could change by forgiving student loans. I'm finished. Okay. Um, thank you, Danielle. Brady, who's next? Thank you. You're welcome. I just submitted uh, Brenda Humphrey, who is here speaking on behalf of herself. Okay. Brenda, can you hear me? Nope, connecting. Brenda, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, wonderful. Um, thanks for joining the committee this afternoon. You will have three minutes to address them with your comments with a 30 second reminder that your time is about to expire. So with that, your time begins now. Thank you. Okay, I am a graduate a st student loan borrower who has been retired from education for seven years now. Um, I feel like I am. Uh, th this committee could impact a lot of folks. There's, there have to be other people out there like me, um, who just barely missed the arbitrary date that was set for the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program of 2006. I have 24 years of teaching altogether, but the problem is, I retired in 2016, and the years only counted from 2007 when um, the, the um, guidelines were relaxed a few years ago, I went ahead and applied for it, got my certification from my last employer, and they gave me nine years, um, but that, that's not enough because you had to have the 10. I feel like if, if a small adjustment could be made in that date, 
uh, that it would pick up lots of people like me. I entered the teaching profession uh, when I was 35. So I got a master's and um, a specialist degree to help my um, retirement level. And I got those, you know, mid, mid career and later. So um, <clears throat> I, that arbitrary date has hindered um, my public service loan forgiveness. My daughter, who is a district attorney, uh, an ADA, has already got her law school loans um, marked off, which is just awesome. She has the 10 years, but yet I have 24 but of years of public service, but I cannot get my loans marked off because of that date. Um, I, 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 you know, I implore the committee to please try to look at that. I know it is a law and uh, the adjustments may not be easy to make, but I feel like that would impact um, and help without having to come up with a lot of other new guidelines. <clears throat> I appreciate um, you listening. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brenda. Um, Brady, who's next? All right, I just admitted uh, Amari Fenoy, who is the training and programs manager at the NAACP. Okay, um, Amari, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. You will have three minutes to address the committee with the 30-second notice that your time is about to expire. So with that, your time begins now. Good afternoon. My name is Amari Fenoy, and I serve as a training and programs manager for the NACP Youth and College. Um, I'm also a student loan borrower myself. I appreciate the opportunity to share my thoughts with the Department of Education Negotiation Rulemaking Committee, and I thank you for your dedicating your time to hear my comment and to work to establish new rules. Um, I continue. I, I come from East St. Louis, Illinois, a small town where the median household income ranges between between $17,000 and $26,000 annually. Um, I earned my bachelor's degree from Spelman College and a master's from the University of Missouri. Uh, today, I am burdened with over $64,000 in student loan debt. Additionally, my mother um, has a parent plus loan of $140,000, which has accumulated $30,000 in interest, bringing our combined student loan debt to a staggering $234,000. Um, during my time at Spelman Historically Black College, I witnessed many of my peers leave school due to financial restraints. HBCUs like Spelman often receive less funding compared to predominantly white institutions. Um, my ability to continue my education was only possible due to my mother's um, sacrifices. Currently, I am facing a monthly student loan payment of 500 under the SAVE program, in addition to living expenses, car payments, and the concerns of my mother's $1,200 um, monthly repayment for my education. It's overwhelming to see a single mother who has dedicated nearly three decades to federal service and raised me to be a responsible adult struggle, struggle under these immense financial burdens. Unfortunately, the program like SAVE offer little support to parents who go through great, great lengths to protect their children from predatory loans. Um, I grew up believing that education was a pathway out of poverty. However, this belief has not materialized for many in the Black community, especially Black women. Um, we currently hold two thirds of the trillions in student loan debt. It's crucial that we ensure that Black communities are not trapped in a cycle of debt. Um, African Americans often require learn loans for education but face challenges repaying them due to the economic disparities post-graduation. Um, student loan debt forgiveness is not just a relief, it's a necessary step towards enabling home ownership, entrepreneurship, and accumulation of assets and investments for the Black community. Um, I sincerely thank you for your attention and earnestly hope for a resolution that supports over 40 million borrowers overwhelmed with student loan debt. And that's my time. Thank you, Amari. We appreciate your time. Brady, who's next? All right, I just admitted Thera Blasio, who uh, is here on behalf of the Spousal Consolidation Organization, Do Us Part. Hi, Thera, can you hear me? Good afternoon, it's Tara. Yes, I can. Tara, okay, wonderful. Um, so you will have three minutes to address the committee with a 30 second notice that your time is about to expire. So with that, you can go ahead and begin now. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I am representing borrowers in joint spousal consolidation loans and I'm a proud member of spousal consolidation do us part. With every day that passes witnessing the stalled implementation of public law 117-200, borrowers like me are reminded that our identity and autonomy were wiped away in 2006 when Congress shuttered the precarious joint loan program yet provided no pathway out for the young married professionals already ensnared in it, many of whom were scared to sign the paperwork by their servicers. 
Consolidation loan enforcement is merciless. There's no way out, not with legal separation, divorce, chronic illness, disability, marital neglect, orders of protection or domestic violence, not even in the death of one of the spouses. For divorce borrowers like me, the pain from that tether never leaves. My story is that my loan nearly defaulted as my marriage devolved due to emotional abuse and neglect. My, signed the, my ex signed the agreement, refused to pay and refuses still. He will not reply to messages. And yet post-divorce, I, a single parent have paid back more than double of what I borrowed. Because I'm a co-payer, because I'm a co-payer, co-payer, excuse me, the thank you for your payment emails get sent to his inbox. The only way to save myself was to save him too. In fact, 37% of JCL borrowers remain shackled to abusive or uncooperative spouses only through these loans. Continuing servicing of these loans sustains economic abuse as defined under the Violence Against Women's Act reauthorization of 2022. Abusers can still exert control. There's no true safety if there's no true freedom. It is psychologically draining and at times dangerous. Further, because 82% of these borrowers have FIFA loans, we have faithfully paid for decades locked out of any relief or federal benefits, including payment pause, 0% interest, fresh start for default, PSLF or IDR forgiveness. During the pandemic pause, these borrowers on average paid $15,431. We are still barred from reconsolidating today. A recent survey of a sample of 53 borrowers had collectively made <laughs> $861,703 in payments over the course of the pause. But the combined balance for the group dropped $3,237. Average monthly payments were less than interest accumulation. The runaway effect continues. A startling 30% of our group have paid 150% of their original balances already. We are hardworking, tax-paying, older borrowers, nearly half 50 to 70 years old. 91% of us are public servants. Sarah, you have 30 seconds minutes. left as we lose the race against time to save for retirement. I am here to say that we have suffered for far too long. We are calling on the secretary to use his authority granted in HEA section 432A, which relates to the waiver of federal student loans to cancel the remaining joint loans. Discharge of these loans will save the government the administrative and cost burden necessary to disentangle these complex and highly nuanced loans. It's time to give all joint spousal loan holders our peace of mind back, our rights to make our own financial decisions back and our hope back. Thank you. Thank you, Tara. We appreciate your time and comments. Brady, who's next? Uh, Cindy, I just submitted Faluke Akinkuni, who is here on behalf of the University of Connecticut chapter of the NAACP. Okay, wonderful. Faluke, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Wonderful. Welcome this afternoon, and you will have three minutes to address the committee with a 30-second reminder that your time is about to expire. So with that, your time begins now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Faluke Akinkumi, and I'm currently a junior at the University of Connecticut, majoring in political science. I wanted to first start off by thanking the Department of Education Negotiated Rulemaking Committee for providing me with this space to speak with you all. Today, I wanted to share a personal story about the profound impact that student debt had on my life. Although I was born in the United States, I was raised in Canada and have always been drawn to the abundant opportunities available in this country. As the daughter of Nigerian immigrants, my parents had instilled in me the importance of education. Unfortunately, we were aware that they would not be able to support me financially, even though they wanted to, as they continue to pay off their student loan debts um, well into their 50s. When I received my acceptance into the university, I was fortunate enough to receive a full tuition scholarship for four years. However, this scholarship did not cover my full cost of attendance as an out-of-state student. The dream of attending college seemed impossible, especially since my parents, not living in the U.S., were unable to secure a Parent PLUS loan on my behalf. Luckily, a family member agreed to co-sign a private loan through Sally Mae, making it possible for me to pursue my education. Throughout each semester, I faced the uncertainty of whether I would be able to afford to come back each next semester. The weight of student loan debt constantly hung over me, limiting my freedom to fully explore my interests. The first four semesters, I worked tirelessly to secure scholarships and grants and to avoid taking extra loans. I am now grateful to find myself in a position where I've received full funding for my next few years at the, for my undergraduate education. And I share my story this way to shed light that defite, despite the sacrifices my family and I have made, despite the Pell grants and full tuition scholarships I received, despite the fact that I've worked to finance the final two years of my undergraduate education, I currently owe $78,682.79 in private loans alone and $12,000 in federal loans. 
I also want to share with you that coming to university has allowed me to find my passion in law and that now I have aspirations to advocate for the Black community and Black medical malpractice cases pertaining to maternity and birth injuries. However, as I plan for my future, I'm faced with a paralyzing decision of whether it's worth it to endure three more years of student loan debt to pursue my career goals in law school. Black people in the United States have endured centuries of oppression, yet we have exhibited remarkable resilience. Luke, you have 30 seconds left and building a community of strength and wisdom. We started the race 400 years behind our white counterparts, yet we continually find ourselves at the finish line. Student loan debt presents a significant barrier by targeting the one thing that no one can take away from us, our minds. We have the right to access to education. We have the right to liberate ourselves mentally. Student loan debt is a violation of these rights and disproportionately impacts black and brown people in the United States. If the US genuinely aspires for a future free from the current systemic racism white America has been built on, it starts with our access to education. It starts um, with freedom from student loan debt. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Faluki. Have a nice afternoon. Brady, we have time for one more. Yep. Uh, I just submitted our final speaker uh, for this negotiated rulemaking, Janiah Moore, who's here representing the uh, uh, NAACP and is a uh, Virginia Youth and College co-advisor. Okay, Janiah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, wonderful. You will have three minutes to address the committee this afternoon with a 30-second reminder that your time is about to expire. So having said that, your time begins now. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. Um, before I start, I would like to thank the Department of Education Negotiated Ruling Committee for taking the time to listen to my story. Um, I know that you guys are all working very, very diligently um, to establish something related to the compromise of federal student loans. Um, again, my name is Jenea Moore, and I'm honored to speak before you today as a representative of the NAACP um, serving as a co-advisor of the Virginia State Conference. Additionally, I am a proud member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated. Um, and currently I am a proud HBCU law student attending the University of District of Columbia, David A. Clark School of Law. And like many others, I am a student loan borrower. Um, growing up in a home where education was not just valued, but considered a top priority, I understand the transformative power that it does hold. Um, as a first-generation college student and a second-generation citizen to Jamaican immigrants, my family has made many sacrifices to establish themselves in America still to date. Um, unfortunately, they never had the financial means to provide for much, if any, of my college education. Um, during my undergrad years, I was a Pell Grant recipient. My mother did take out Parent PLUS loans to support me. However, due to her own financial barriers, she couldn't take out more loans to cover my schooling, which then left me with the full financial burden of taking out additional loans to complete my education. Um, upon graduation, um, I was able to secure a job, but with low pay, um, and then also repayment plans starting back up with my student loans, coupled with other financial responsibilities and bills, um, it for fortunately did lead me to take on a second job. Despite my aspirations to further my own education, financial constraints did force me to defer on my loans when I ended up returning to school to complete my master's degree. Um, after completing my master's degree, I am actually now happy to say again that I'm finally pursuing my dream of becoming an attorney um, for that actually the first attorney and first doctor in my family. Um, the return on investment for my education has been more than rewarding for me, my family, and my community. However, now living in D.C., the high cost of living that comes Linnea, with you have 30 seconds left. Okay. Um, the cost of living that does come with that um, does present some additional challenges that I am concerned about. Um, I do commend the efforts made with help, helping us figure out ways to make our payments, particularly the SAVE repayment plan, but it has provided financially challenging um, barriers for me still making um, loan payments now with that starting back up. And I must express my concern about that feasibility for myself. And I know many others that may have the same concern. Um, in conclusion, I do urge this esteemed committee to continue to consider um, the real world implications that student loan does have on individuals like myself and others. Um, so thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Janae. Have a great afternoon. Thank you. 
So with that, that concludes the public speaking um, time that we have today. We want to thank everyone who um, was able to participate today and took the time to join the committee. So with that, we will um, stand adjourned until tomorrow morning when we will start back in for the final final day.